interesting class. Did you like living in the city? Loved it. What do you feel about what's happened to the city? Are you sad about all the new building that's... I don't like that. Yeah, what I mean, is the new <laughs> What is that? Is that? That's a new Barbican. Oh, it's yes, rather it's... inhuman kind of... Uh, I remember it was taken very seriously when it first went up after yes. the war. It's the beginning of the rot. I don't think it'll go on. Barbican. 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 It's a massive complex. The Barbican. The Barbican. Barbican. The Barbican. More than 2,000 separate flats are planned for the Barbican. 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 Barbican Art Gallery. Barbican Art Centre. Barbican. 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 This is the Barbican Art Centre in London. Barbican. 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 Splendid Barbican Centre. What did you think of the Barbican film? Quite liked it. I wasn't as enthusiastic as everyone else was. I thought it was terrific. I thought it went on rather too long. I didn't want it to end. Barbican. Yeah. Hey! Barbican. The Barbican, it's not just an art centre, it's a village, and I'm going to show you around. We've got a week here, so let's go outside now. This afternoon's performance at the Barbican Hall will begin in ten minutes. You know the long flashbacks, didn't you think they worked really well? On the night of the 29th of December, 1940, the city of London suffered one of the worst bombing raids of the war. In that one night, nearly 60 acres of residential, commercial and financial buildings in the Barbican area, between Aldersgate and Moorgate, were either completely flattened or destroyed by fire. They left us with a devastated area of some 40 acres, which we called by its old name, Barbican. You'll be able to tell me why this is called the Barbican. Barbican because there used to be a Roman fort here. And the word Barbican means one of the outer posts of a fortress. Right. Behold a desert. There was no great haste, for who will hurry to improve a waste? by heart of the commercial city, in daytime at any rate, was busy with half a million commuters. The city of London, a hub of wealth and tradition with its own unique place in the life of a nation and in the world of commerce. Around 400,000 Monday to Friday commuters come in from the suburbs and greater London. See how like cattle for the butcher bound they jostle battle on the underground. But by night, it was almost empty. They called it a square mile of cats and caretakers. That's the city outside working hours, you know. Dead. So we cleaned the desolation's face, but for long years put nothing in its place. And then the arguments began. It's always been a commercial area, and probably the most valuable bit of ground in Britain. Why change its function now and lose a packet? Anyway, you won't get anything from the government. It'll all have to come out of the rates. The City of London should have more to offer than profits. Without a living community, it's just a factory town. But by the mid-50s, a consensus had emerged, a determination that whatever else might happen, the Barbican must once again become lively. <laughs> double, double, toil and trouble! So here, amid elegant walkways and tower blocks, it was thought,
was an opportunity to give some of those commuters a chance of living near their work. New Barbican's a city on its own that is not built for business alone. Here, like the farmer, you may win your bread. Take lunch and tea and dine and go to bed. No bolted breakfasts fatal to the spleen. No frantic dashes for the 8.15. No getting home, the daily fret and fear. For happy labourers, your home is here. Forget the brolly, park the bowler hat. Here is the office, there the comfy flat. Here is a library and shops and schools and quiet walks green trees and lily pools. Here you may love and marry and indeed, if you will pardon the expression, breed. This man has been on strike for 10 months. He has come to this meeting in a Liverpool pub to rally support. Back in London, two five million pound building projects are at a standstill. For 10 months now, government, employers and trade unions have been defied and outmaneuvered by the militants. This strike bound site is phase four of the Barbican part of a futuristic building project in London costing 36 million pounds. Work stopped here on October the 21st last year. The contractor sacked the whole workforce after a walkout and said six stewards would not get their jobs back. Protesting victimization, the militants set up a picket. The casualness of these men is deceptive. The two picket lines are manned by some of the shrewdest and toughest shop stewards in the industry. Men like Lou Lewis, 29, a communist carpenter and chief steward at the Barbican. He will not get his job back. Michael Houlihan, 33, a communist. He was the scaffolder's steward at the Barbican. He came to London from Dublin. He won't get his job back. Rolf Langdon, 33, carpenter and communist. His union executive expelled him, but the lay members reversed the decision. Sacked after only four days on the site, he was reinstated and became a steward. He will not get his job back. Frank Campbell, 27, painter's shop steward. He was on strike for a month before the rest of the job stopped. He recently resigned in disgust from the Labour Party. He too is being sued for damages. Close to their place of employment, but will have schools, shops, open spaces, and all other amenities to enable them to live. It sounded fine, but we only had 40 acres to play with, remember and the residential population had to be of sufficient size, round about 7,000. The list of amenities went on growing as long as your arm. An arts centre, a student's hostel, a library, new buildings for the Guildhall Schools of Music and Drama, new buildings for the City of London School for Girls. To most people, the site must have presented a bewildering muddle. You're not lost, are you, like everyone else here? No, 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 no. An ambitious and expensive 25-acre complex has risen from the urban desert less than a mile from St. Paul's Cathedral. The Barbican is what the engineers and planners like to call completely pedestrianised. An area where you don't have to dodge traffic, where they put the motor car in its place. You drive in on the low level, park in your own particular spot. And there's the lift waiting to take you up to your flat. It's easy to get home when you're one of the relatively few city workers who don't have to commute. I live in the Barbican and I work in the city, so for me it's very convenient indeed. I walk to work and I can come home for lunch if I feel like it. You will notice that the kitchens are designed as internal units, so that all the living rooms get the benefit of the generous window space. Every kitchen has waste disposal. Uh, no, no cooking smells. That's all taken care of by the ventilation. The living areas are unusually spacious, with electric underfloor heating throughout. There's plenty of cupboard space and storage facilities for each flat. We like the community here extraordinarily, don't we? Yes. I think this is the nicest thing about Barbican, really, the people. There's soundproofing throughout, of course, and that helps people of different tastes to live comfortably with one another. <laughs> In that last bit, they should, of course, have been using a scarf, but in the absence of any such thing, they had to make do with a pair of Rudy's old tights, and 
Bryony Bryn said she was going to keep them as a souvenir. And now cast an eye over this rather peculiar advertisement that's just appeared in London's underground stations. It's not intended, at least I don't think it is, to evoke memories of the hoary old chestnut that the average musician is so dim he can't tell his brass from his oboe. Rather is it designed to underline the fact that the new Barbican Arts Centre, which the Queen opens on Wednesday, is rather tucked away in the city of London, on a part of the map which to most theatre and concert goers is usually marked, here be dragons. I don't know. Times change, I admit. People too, I suppose. But an art centre in the city? That's going a bit far, isn't it? Oh, I know the theatre's going to be a marvellous building with the most modern equipment and its own drama school. I know all that. And a great concert hall with yet another school and even more students. A library, probably a cinema, and an art gallery. All I'm asking is, are we going to see a fair return? To agree. The city's function is to create wealth, purely and simply. And that, on that basis, the whole Barbican development, including the flats, um, including the residential accommodation around the centre, was misguided from the first. Um, the city's function is to create wealth. Therefore, m for more office blocks, if necessary, should have been built in the area of the Barbican. On the contrary. It is a remarkable monument to civic ambition. This is something quite rare in this country, and all credit should really go to the Corporation of London for taking on such an ambitious venture. Hello and good evening to you from the heart of the City of London, from the new Barbican Centre. After 25 years of planning and construction, the new Barbican now embraces, around its concrete lake, not only the City of London School for Girls, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, and residential flats, but an impressive centre for arts and conferences. Rather an impressive skyscraper, very grudgy. Funny place, actually. Making their first visit for a tryout concert are the Philip Jones Brass Ensemble. Right, let's go. It cost a lot of money, didn't it? How much was it, Fletch? Well, it started off, I think, at five million. I think at the moment it's 143 million. But, I, mean, but I, mean, I mean, you look at the actual solidness of the building. I mean, the, the, the amount of concrete absolutely defies the imagination. It's concrete, all right. My yeah. goodness, I should think it'll last forever. It'll last more for more than ever. This? Look at this. I know. Well, well, well. Quite fine, isn't it? Well, I've been here 12 years, and the art centre was uh, nothing more than a hole in the ground almost when I moved in. Uh, yes, it would have been nice to have had it years ago. Uh, it's been problems in noise and disruption and so on, but I think we all hope it'll be well worth it. Now, can you explain to us exactly uh, what the centre contains in this model? Yes, indeed. The whole centre is set on an artificial lake uh, with a vast terrace in the front. And you have your concert hall here with the art gallery and the conference centre above. The Royal Shakespeare here, you can just see the fly tower, surrounded by a huge conservatory. And then the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, with its theatres and rehearsal rooms and conference faci er, concert facilities right there. Henry Rong was appointed administrator of the Arts Centre in 1970. He'd already worked on the Lincoln Centre in New York and on the National Arts Centre in Ottawa. I don't know how a female dinosaur felt when she gave birth to a baby dinosaur. But I've been here for 12 years, and I don't sleep very well at night because we are building up to this enormous opening. And a strange thing happened this morning. I went to St. Paul's at 8 o'clock to invoke a little extra help. And I suddenly found the dean, who is a friend of mine, offering up a prayer. And I was extremely grateful to him because I need all the help I can get. There's not many building firms in the country that could tackle a job like this. And, it, you know, and easily you look around from here, it'll take you a week to walk around this site all over. And it's absolutely marvellous. Over 28,000 working drawings have had to be made for the art centre alone. Well, the first thing is that one of the architect's jobs is to have a broad back and be beaten. I mean, it's one of his principal jobs. But I quite accept the fact that people do not respond well to modern architecture on the hill because very often it has a sort of spare austerity about it. I must say, I would have thought for an art centre it would be more colourful. The London Symphony Orchestra, for their part, 
wanted a hall with a full, rich sound. The spacious scale of the interior takes the Philip Jones Brass Ensemble by surprise. That is Pretty fantastic. Striking, isn't it? <clears throat> what a fantastic shape. Mm. It's very wide, this hall, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Yeah. That's the way you've got to get on. The work area. It's the only way. It's the only way. Yeah. Really? So, come on, what about this joke? How long does it take to change a light bulb in the bulb again? <laughs> well, it depends on how high it is, really. And here we have an equally vivid picture of one aspect of the inside. It's the concert hall, I believe. Yes, it's unfortunately a photograph I'm not very fond of because all these wretched little architects' models that you see of people sitting here indicate a house not fully sold out, and I hope this will never be the case at Barbican. But it's a beautiful concert hall. It seats just over 2,000. Um, as you can see, it's panelled in wood. We have approximately 1,600 perspex uh, globes that glitter in the ceiling. They're put there for acoustic purposes as well as aesthetic purposes. The Barbican planners construct an extremely accurate scale model, still just big enough to get inside. Dr. Raphael Orlovsky explains. Well, the reason for building and testing the model of the concert hall is that it gives us a much better insight into the acoustical quality of the concert hall before the real building is built. Some method of breaking the sound up had to be devised and the architect thought of suspending these plastic spheres from the ceiling 2,000 of them in three different sizes. Maybe if you're getting bored with the concert, you could look up there and find inspiration. Yes. Lost amongst those glass domes. Count, count the globes. Yeah. One of the most interesting tests that we do in the model is to play music through the model and then record the music on a little dummy person and assess the acoustical quality of the concert hall model in different seats. Now, because this is a one to eight scale model, then the music has to be speeded up eight times and the pitch is also increased eight times, which is three octaves. I'm now replaying the third movement of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony into the scale model at eight times normal speed, and this is being recorded by the little eight scale model person, and when the recording is over, we can listen to the recording at normal speed. The acoustics of the model has now been impressed on the original music, and when we listen to it at slow speed, we'll be able to hear the quality, of the acoustical quality of the concert hall. Finally, this one came from uh, Mark Thatcher. Um, how on earth do I find the Barbican Centre? <laughs> I've been driving around for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> Delta 2. I've covered the area, Governor. No, no sign of them up here. Where the hell are you? I'm on the roof. I told you to follow the exit signs. I did. And I'm on the roof. I asked for 30 officers. They're all inside. Totally lost. Now, this it's slogan, it's... I'm getting lost in the Barbican. It's not has a it, slogan. <laughs> has it rather backfired? Because it, it's true, isn't it? Well, some people get lost in the Barbican, yes, but of course my pat re reply to that is that if you came here often enough, you wouldn't.
That, I'm afraid, is all we have time for this week, but in two weeks' time, our next programme will be on the subject of opera. From the City of London, we wish you good night. Victoria, what's Hello. your name? John. John, you've got an enormous job. Is it just you who do all the No, to do there's all three this? of us on here. It takes us about, calling about a month to six weeks to get round the job. And then it's time about. to do it again, though, isn't it? Oh, exactly, yeah, yeah. It's a bit like doing the fourth bridge, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. We never stop on it. We just keep going round. Now, I want to get out. Oh, no. No, no. Yeah. Right, lovely. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.